Hi friends, welcome back. Good evening to all. Welcome back again, Coastal Students Cultural Forums Ocean Literacy Webinar Series. And now we have two energetic ocean friends for uh, conversating with us in the topic coastal resilience and how we can make engagement with the people for marine conservation. Let me introduce Nisha Disusa, director of Eco Niche, and she has completed her uh, graduate studies in University of Sydney, Australia, and she holds an MPhil in conservation leadership from University of Cambridge. So she has working as director for uh, Eco Niche from last year, 2019. Welcome, Nisha. Welcome. Thank you. To our Ocean Literacy Webinar Series. And I'm very proud and privileged to introduce Chio Pei Rong. She's one of my colleagues. She's a proud Chevening Scholar. And she also doing uh, International uh, Marine Biodiversity Office for Singapore. And she also uh, participated and created a indigenous marine uh, science program in Singapore and with more than 500 volunteers and uh, particularly she is focusing on uh, the activities and conservation activities with intertidal biodiversity. Thank you for both of you, uh, both of you for joining with us and welcome all, all the participants to the webinar series and I wish a fruitful discussion ahead and and I'm giving the baton to Dr. Johnson Jamal, the advisor of Coastal Students Cultural Forum for moderating the webinar series. It's over you, Johnson. Hey, thank you very much, Kumar. Thank you very much for finding uh, Nisha wrong for today's uh, session. Uh, this is your uh, hard work and also maybe your personal uh, connection made this possible for today's webinar. That is great. So I welcome both uh, speakers again. I, I know, uh, I came to know that Nisha is actually, uh, I already know somebody who's speaking today. That is a good thing. And uh, how does it work? Uh, the, each speaker may be uh, spending about 15 to 20 minutes. Then after uh, they finish, both their sessions uh, finished, then there will be question and answer sessions about 20 minutes. So altogether, we are hoping to do by one hour. So, and if the speakers and the participants are happy, we may continue a little bit more uh, if we have time, if the technology allows us to do. So now over to the uh, speakers. So Nisha, do you want to speak first or do you have an agreement? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, you can, yeah, I'm going yeah, first. You can, yeah, you can speak first, then Peirong uh, will uh, join after you finish. Okay. 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 Participants, Sounds you good. are also welcome to listen to these eminent speakers. So now, over to Nisha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Can everyone see my screen that I'm sharing? Yes, I can see. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, so thank you for having me and um, for listening in to this webinar. Uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about coastal resilience. And uh, for context, I'll refer to a study we did a while ago in Vishakhapatnam city in Andhra Pradesh. Um, this was soon after Cyclone Hoodhood hit in 2014. So many of you will remember that the cyclone caused a lot of devastation and suffering um, in and around Vishakhapatnam. And we went in there six months after the cyclone hit. Uh, we interviewed over 900 coastal households in and around the city because we were interested in finding out what local factors helped or prevented families from recovering from the impacts of the cyclone. And so indirectly increasing or decreasing their resilience to disasters. So let's start with a definition of resilience. Um, resilience is based on the belief that humans and nature are strongly linked. So simply put, resilience is how communities or human society and natural or ecological systems, and in this case, coastal ecosystems, 
cope with and resist disruptive change. So change like disasters, health risks, things like that. So we extended this definition to include the ability of these systems to not just recover from change, but to also build back stronger so that if the change happened again or the disruption happened again, they were able to withstand it. So around coastal resilience, there are several themes that help us break down the different components that contribute to building resilience. And during the study, we examined several of them. So the first one that we looked at was diversity and red redundancy. So this is the recognition that there are many different species, people, sources of knowledge, types of skills that support the functioning of natural ecosystems as well as human systems in the so-called normal times. But when a change occurs, like a cyclone, some of these components or some of these species or some of these skills may be compromised. But there should always be others that can step in to carry out those same functions so that the system runs normally. So in our study, we found that in areas that had high diversity of natural coastal infrastructure, like mangroves or sand dunes, human lives and infrastructure were almost always protected. This isn't new. We knew that after the 2004 tsunami, the studies that came out showed that mangroves really contributed to protecting human lives and cities, villages, infrastructure in general. But in areas that had plantations, and along the Vishakhapatnam coastline, there's a lot of casual plantations, a lot of Palmera um, palm plantations. Some of the infrastructure was still protected, but not to the extent that the mangroves protected them. And the reason for this was because the plantations were largely just one species. And so when those, when those plants were affected by the winds or the rains, there was nothing to take their place to protect the infrastructure that was behind them. But in particular, we found that where natural ecosystems had been completely destroyed or degraded, nature-based livelihoods like fisheries, um, coastal farming, tourism, they suffered the most. What in, assess, in essence this means is that some sections of society would be forced further into poverty because they no longer have a dependable source of income. And in fact, 86% of the 900 households that we interviewed anticipated that it would take them two years or more to recover. And that's assuming that there were no worse storms or disruptive events that would affect them. But as we know, there were several disruptive events that did affect um, our coastlines beyond 2014. There was the demonetization all the way to the current health pandemic. The second theme that we looked at was connectivity. We know that well-connected natural ecosystems can recover from disturbances more easily. Unfortunately, in the case of Vishakhapatnam, there has been a lot of construction of concretized beach fronts, ports, harbors, and to protect this infrastructure from strong winds and waves, a seawall was built. Now, this has caused severe disconnect in the way in which sediments flow along the coastline. So in some parts along the Vishakhapatnam coastline, new beaches started appearing. And in other parts, some beaches disappeared completely because there was severe erosion and there was no sediment to replenish the, the, the sand that was being washed away. So this in turn had an impact on marine fisheries because fish species and their habitats were being adversely affected. All in all, this increased the vulnerability of the fishing communities in that area, um, particularly in the long term, because it's a continuing event. It was not just an acute event that happened um, at the time. The third theme we studied was participation and learning. So two types of households that really stood out as being able to recover better after the cyclone were the female-led households and those that were headed by people who had a secondary education or higher. So in the female-led households, what was happening was that many family members who were working had very different jobs and livelihoods. So even if one person's job was affected by the cyclone, another family member was still able to bring in some money. So they, had, they weren't financially um, insecure. 
And this speaks also to the diversity theme that we that I mentioned above, because the more diversity you have within the household, the higher the resilience. But female-led households were also more likely to save money, particularly for their children's education. So they were able to use these savings in times of need. In the second type of household, that is those that were headed by people who had a higher secondary education, these households and families were simply able to access government relief. They were able to apply for relief schemes. And in the long term, because they had a better education, they were able to get new skills and knowledge more easily. So here there is also opportunity to promote financial innovation for to better manage recovery after disaster. Instead of relying just on post-disaster government relief, insurance could be helpful to transfer some of this risk exposure to weather events. And believe it or not, amongst the 900 households, only one household had insurance, and that was for their crops. We also found that traditional sources of knowledge, like how to build houses from local species, um, including coconut trees and such, that traditionally were being built to withstand strong winds and waves, that knowledge still existed in the communities. Unfortunately, the resources to build those houses no longer existed because coconut trees and lots of local species have been cut down and decimated for development purposes. So families in time have been forced to build alternate houses. And although concrete houses um, were desirable, are desirable, they are definitely more expensive to build. So the majority of people there had either semi-concrete houses or mud-thatched houses. And 70% of the mud-thatched houses following the cyclone were completely damaged, whereas only 1% of the fully concrete houses were damaged. So although recently we've been noticing, particularly in India, that there's been increasing encouragement to, to listen to traditional ways of living and revert back to them, in some cases, our pathways to coastal development have prevented this from happening. And decision makers don't always realize these ground realities. So it's really important that there's participatory decision making and that all voices um, are, are heard in the conversation. The final thing, our final recommendation to policy and decision makers, um, as well as urban planners in Vishakhapatnam city, was to foster adaptive systems thinking. Um, and this is in order to think of all the different systems, the natural systems, the social systems, the economic systems, and the connections between them to develop resilience um, expertise, as well as to factor in the physical risks into city planning policies and strategies. And this means that accepting within social and ecological systems that there are several connections occurring at different levels. And these connections will change over time as the climate changes, as our environment changes. Even now in this COVID scenario, things are changing rapidly. So there has to be recognition of these changes and we have to adapt to incorporate these changes to reduce risk and increase resilience. So we need to strategically build and rebuild and continuously relook at our recovery and relief systems um, to disasters. And we need to test these systems and we need to learn from our mistakes and build back better. And to do this, it's extremely important that studies and research look at local and household levels because disasters and disruptions do not affect everyone in the same way. So I just Put a few, I've put the paper that we published um, on this study. Um, the two photos are from Vishakhapatnam city shortly after the cyclone hit. As you can see, the city is very vulnerable. Um, below is a mud thatched house that was completely decimated. Uh, a lot of communities in these houses were evacuated, so the death toll was not that high, but they did lose a lot of their property and assets. and. Um, their livelihoods in some cases, if they were fishermen or coastal farmers, because during the cyclone, sea level rises pretty high, and um, a lot of the coastal farms were inundated by um, seawater. Um, I also put my contact details, so please do get in touch if, um, if you have any questions and aren't able to ask during this um, webinar. Thank you. Hey, uh, 
thank you nisha that is fantastic uh, there is a well uh, presented uh, you used two slides uh, within these two slides you summarize everything what you have done maybe some a uh, few years uh, that is very good i think the participants also enjoyed this very short summary of what you have done that's very good i have a lot of points i have taken i'm not going to discuss okay. everything but as some of the things maybe the participant can also ask a lot of questions maybe later they will do through chat box uh, in our last session also they have a lot of questions they asked one particular thing i am very much interested in that there is a connection between high resilience and uh, diversity uh, that is very important and also the interdisciplinary factors so a lot of factors like uh, uh, the social system economic system and also the biodiversity actually or natural system they all work together so that you also mentioned about the traditional knowledge and coastal infrastructure uh, these are very useful uh, terminologies for a lot of participants uh, here thank you uh, very much nisha now i uh, invite our next uh, speaker it's over to you ping peron please all right thank you very much for having me here this evening uh, i'm peron and i'm actually based in singapore so i don't have a lot of um contextual knowledge on what's happening in india but uh, i just like to share with you today a little bit of my experiences uh, in singapore as well as in um, when i was in cambridge so i'm just going to share my screen all right so today i'm going to share with you a little bit more about how i'm engaging people for for marine conservation and uh, because it's often very context specific so you have to look at uh, who your target audience is what your message is and what you hope um, to to make a difference so what's your call to action as well so i'm going to sh just share a few stories with you this evening and i hope you can get some tips from some of these stories so um one of the things that i really love and enjoy is um, this program called intertidal watch intertidal watch is a, is a citizen science program that seeks to engage people to come on board and monitor the biodiversity uh, in our intertidal habitats in uh, some areas in singapore so basically, I gathered um, the park managers because in Singapore, we have um, terrestrial parks and some of these parks are, are coastal parks. So adjacent to these parks, we have the intertidal areas. So most of our park managers, some of them don't have, um, they're not marine biologists and they don't have that knowledge because they manage more of the terrestrial components. So I brought them down and I showed them about the, the intertidal area and I got them interested in um, loving these areas as well. And then slowly, I started working with them to create uh, this protocol that we implement uh, during low tide uh, where we collect data using a very systematic um, sampling design method that we continue to adopt. So this program was started in about 2015. So I had a few trials with the park managers first because I thought it would be, it would be great to have their um, support because they are managing the parks. And then slowly we brought in the volunteers. And I think since 2016 till today, we have got, we've got more than four, uh, 500 volunteers who, are going, who have gone down with us to collect data. So the whole idea around this citizen science program is you don't have to be a scientist to do science. So basically anyone can do it. So most of my volunteers are, are public volunteers, uh, as well as a few uh, park managers as well. And they come from all walks of life. So some of them are from like the food and beverage industry, some of them work at hospitals, some of them are students, quite a number of retirees too as well. So they come down together with me during the low tide and they would follow the methods that we've set in place to collect data in these um, little quadrats that you see over here. So the square quadrats. And they follow this particular sampling design method. So basically they also learn about science. They, they learn about how they can identify the different species, how you could tell a sea cucumber from a sea anemone, and why is it so important that we just sample within the specific um, quadrants and the squares that we use instead of um, collecting data uh, all over. So with that, uh, we've collected a lot of data and we're still in the midst of analyzing the data. And of course, with citizen science programs, some people are a little bit skeptical about the information that um, the information and the data collected arising from um, citizens. So what we do is also we do a lot of data verification and, identif and identifying the the animals through their photos. So my volunteers, after they've learned um, what we can find on our shores, they also become guides 
So some of my volunteers, they volunteer as guides and they bring the public out during low tide to guided walks. So the special thing about intertidal area is that um, you don't have to be a diver or a swimmer to be able to just enjoy uh, and be connected with nature. So the whole idea is connecting people with nature and bring them to these places to see nature. So in Singapore, it's a bit of a different context because um, it's a very highly urbanized area where people sometimes get a little bit out of touch with nature because we live in such a very urban concrete jungle. So the whole idea of connecting people with nature, raising their awareness in nature, as well as um, translating um, what they have learned into actionable um, into actions that they can use to help conserve and protect nature is very important in our context. So here we, we see uh, volunteers um, just sharing what they've learned with other people as well. And you can see even children get really, really um, curious. And what you see on the, on the ground here are, are sea cucumbers that we find on, on our seagrass patches. And all these are just found on the mainland of Singapore, which is already a very highly urbanized area. And people really do appreciate it because it's not something that they see every day in Singapore. And we also had another event uh, where we had volunteers who went down with us early in the morning at about 4 a.m. And we started um, collecting some of the animals um, to put them into tanks so that we can showcase uh, some of these animals to the general public. Because at the same time, while we try to engage people and connect them with um, the intertidal areas and the, and the marine animals, we want to also minimize the impact on these areas. So that's why we manage the numbers quite carefully. And uh, through this activity, the volunteers learn about um, the different kinds of animals and they also share with the public uh, what sort of animals that they find, kind of bringing nature to people at the same time. So here you see my volunteers actively sharing with the, the general public um, what are some of the marine creatures that we can see in Singapore. And we also use a bit of um, art and craft to reach out to people, um, especially to children. So we had volunteers who would design um, coloring sheets. So right here, you see the, the, little co the little girl coloring something. It was designed by one of my volunteers. And we use art to be able to connect people with nature as well, to get people curious about them, and to get pe people to learn about what kind of biodiversity that we have in Singapore. And we also have lots of um, events and festivals where we make use, use of these activities and events to reach out to more people, to generate greater public awareness in marine conservation. Because I think it's, um, it's a little bit sad, but um, what happens is, what, what's, in, what's the situation in Singapore is most people do not know that we have very exciting marine life in Singapore. And they're often quite surprised when they find out that hey, actually we do have such interesting uh, wildlife in Singapore. So this is an example uh, in this photo is that the Festival of Biodiversity that we hold in Singapore once a year. So there we have booths that are set up by different NGO groups uh, and I had a booth as well where my volunteers were just sharing with the public what kind of animals they have spotted. So the pictures that you see here are all the intertidal animals that have taken by the volunteers and some of the activities that we have had in our surveys. And we also tried to come up with some activities to help uh, different groups of people learn. So um, this, one, this particular one here uh, is a jigsaw puzzle that was made from uh, just photographs and then we cut it up into jigsaw puzzles. So there the children would learn about different kinds of habitats that we have in Singapore. And, and then we have also other games like matching the animal's name to the animal as well as the food web and food chain, uh, food chain game. So we also make use of other opportunities and this particular photo here is at an event at the Asia Dive Expo that happens in Singapore once a year, usually in April where we have a group of, um, where it attracts a group of divers and their families to come and visit this particular exhibition. So there I had a booth again and, and we did something quite similar. And you can see people actually just trying to guess what, what kind of animals those are. So it's really about generating that awareness. And I think it's also very important to start young as well, getting people exposed. And that's why we moved to the Heartland as well, where I also had a, uh, an exhibition booth at a parks festival that is in the heartlands where they attract a different group of people. So these, uh, most of these people are quite surprised to see that we have wildlife and marine wildlife in Singapore. Yeah, so this is the example of the jigsaw that the children are doing. And all these activities are run by my volunteers. So they are, they're just volunteers. Uh, they're volunteers who use it. In the past, they don't really have any experience and knowledge, but not right now, they're actually sharing with other people what they have learned. So my volunteers also run um, workshops as well for for youth and children, uh, and this particular one here is at one of our events uh, at the Festival of Biodiversity where we had some cutouts of um, animals that we've spotted. 
and then we, we laminated them and put them on the, on, the, on the floor, on the ground. And we would kind of teach them how they can conduct an intertidal watch survey using the methods that they've used, the quadrat uh, method uh, with random numbers and things like that. And here's all my volunteers are engaging children. Um, and you can see that they are flipping the photo identification chart that we use for our survey. And one of them is actually recording uh, data as well. So it's really reaching out to people and helping them to understand that anyone can do and help out in uh, collecting data for science as well as for conservation. So it's also very important to work with collaborators. So who you see here is uh, my collaborator from the National University of Singapore, Jolene Chan. And she, used, uh, she works on marine debris. So I have an ongoing marine debris project with, with, with them. And here I collaborated with her to train some volunteers to be able to do outreach for, mar uh, for marine plastics and marine debris. So here we learned about um, what are, why is it important to protect mangroves? What are some of the animals that can get trapped and entangled in um, drift nets? And what, what are some of the things that we can do to help um, the situation as well? So in fact, at one of um, the Asia Dive Expo events, uh, it's really interesting that I saw this particular um, activity. So what you see here are people just trying to collect, um, trying to pick up microplastics from this uh, mess of, of things. And then they would actually make into a little, little cards and they would glue the microplastics on the cards. So this is like a, it's an interactive activity that exposes people to the idea of microplastics, how it can be detrimental to our marine environment, and how and, and just helping people to be more aware about it. And it's also a little bit form of an interactive art process as well, so using art to engage people. So I'm very inspired by Sir David Attenborough because he said that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they've never experienced. And I think it's it's really um it's really the fundamental thing of what we do here. Uh, in Singapore as well, because if we don't connect people with nature, if they don't know what we have on our shores, they wouldn't be able to care about it and they wouldn't be able to even know that they exist. So it's really important for us to connect people with nature. So moving on a little bit to more of the youth things that I've done. Um, so I studied in Cambridge between 20, uh, 2017 and 2018. And uh, the people you see here are um, from the Cambridge University Marine Conserv Conservation Society. So made up of graduates and undergraduate students. And, and then we organized the full first World Oceans Day in 2018. So we managed to get about 22 speakers from different countries as well as different organizations, uh, all the way from the Cambridge Conservation uh, Forum, the Cambridge University Marine Conservation Society. Uh, some of you might know uh, BirdLife International, the UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Center, Flora and Fauna International, Traffic, and some academics. Uh, some people from the government in the UK uh, and a number of um, my fellow course mates from the Enfield and Conservation Leadership. And we also had book talks. So the whole idea behind this is because we were based in this particular building called the David Attenborough Building. And that's where we had um, lots of different big NGOs, international conservation NGOs based in the particular building. So we thought that would be a great chance for them to get together and know about what each other are doing in terms of marine conservation and research. Surprisingly, I think a lot of them, uh, they, they know that everyone's working on something, but they don't really know what they're working on. So I think that helps to really put people together to be able to learn and share with each other what they're doing. So I think that was a really uh, great way of connecting people with each other. And books, uh, we also had two book talks, which were really, really interesting. And after that, uh, so this is what uh, what happened in the David Attenborough building. And I also presented a little bit on um, what I do in Singapore for Intertidal Watch as well. So it's really interesting how um, when you gather people together, you can see how they can work together and you can harness their knowledge, uh, the different kinds of skills that they have and, and be able to create even more new projects. Uh, so for World Oceans Day this year, I'm very happy to share with you that we also organized a youth panel discussion uh, right here in Singapore. So I managed to get youths from uh, different different uh, job scope. And uh, so this is Crystal from a consultancy firm called DHI. And that is Lee Kiang who set up her own um, education enterprise, social enterprise, where she brings people out and gives guided tours for, for people to connect people with nature. And she hires a lot of students from the university to do these guided tours. And this is Nathaniel Soon from our 
from our seas, our legacy, and he uses a lot of um, videography as well as media and he creates beautiful and wonderful videos to showcase the beauty of the marine environment and wildlife to people. So it's also another way to, to do outreach and to engage more people. And then Jonathan, my, my colleague where I work, and we share a little bit more from the perspective of the government as well as from uh, uh, having a lot of experience with working with the NGO. So in this particular panel discussion, we talked a lot about how we can harness the power of youth to engage in marine conservation. So we use different tools as well, like this is from Mentimeter, um, getting a sense of what um, people are thinking about in, for marine conservation in Singa Singapore, because uh, in every country or every um, area, the context is quite different. So it's really interesting to see. We had, I think, more than 250 sign-ups, and we had more than 200 people showing up. And it's just getting a sense of what people care about and what people are interested in. So you can see biodiversity, sustainability, animals, and very happy to see that people think it's important as well. And what they perceive is the biggest threat to Singapore in terms of our marine biodiversity. So ignorance, pollution, humans, plastics, land reclamation, because in Singapore we have a lot of coastal development, climate change as well. So you can see that people are generally quite aware. And it's, it's nice to know that they know the different threats to, to our marine biodiversity in Singapore's context. And I think we ended off our discussion with uh, what is your biggest takeaway from this discussion? So the participants also put in some of their thoughts. And I really like this particular um, site. It says, don't be afraid to step up and take action because any little action counts. And no voice is too soft about marine conservation. And there are lots of organizations to be involved in. I guess um, for the youth in Singapore, sometimes they think um, they're not too sure where they want, where they can start out with. And there are lots of volunteering activities around, but they're sometimes not sure how to enter the particular conservation scene as a student or as a, uh, as a youth. And so we're trying to encourage them to, to speak up, to be the voice for nature, to be the voice for the marine environment as well, and be the one to make a difference. So here's another quote again from Dr. Sylvia Oh. Uh, yeah. So I, I was very lucky to meet her um, at the National University of Singapore once as well. She's very, very inspiring too. So she said, look in the mirror, consider your talents, and think about how you might use them to make a difference. Some have artistic skills. Others are good with numbers or have a way with words. Everyone has the power to make a difference as an individual or by joining the company of others who share a common goal. The key is, is in knowing that what you do matters including doing nothing. So I find this quote really powerful because it, it's about how you can harness your skills, your interests, and your talent to make a difference because different people are interested in different things. People, different people can make a difference in, in, different, in different areas. So I would just like to end off with three main um, things that I, points that I'd like to share. So first is to be relevant. So I mentioned earlier that conservation is very context specific because it depends on um, who your target audience is, uh, what, what is your message, uh, what are the needs of the people, your stakeholders or the, the group of people that you want to reach out to, and what is your call to action. So you have to make conservation relevant to them because sometimes to some people, it might be a very distant um, topic that they don't usually think about. So making things relevant is, is very important. So how can people benefit from it? How can they have value that is created for them as well while you do your conservation work? And the next thing is be creative. So uh, I, I saw that on your Facebook page, um, um, you've done quite a lot of activities, including organizing quizzes and this online webinar as well. It's really great that you're doing such things. So it's very important to be creative, to see how you can use different kinds of media, different platforms, whether it's going, doing it in the classroom, going out in the field, or doing it online virtually as well. So some people use art, some people use music to, to make a difference. Um, and some people use special events or, or leverage on particular days, such as the World Oceans Day, the World Wetlands Day or the International Day of Biological Diversity. So you can pack your events to these big days and make an even bigger call for, for the causes that you, you try to make a difference in. And the third thing and last of all is be open to collaborate with other people. Because many of times we do a lot of things and it's, some things can be very resource intensive, whether it's manpower or whether it's um, cost of getting the materials. 
So be open to collaborate and be very resourceful because when you work with different people, you network with different people, different people come with different set of skills, resources, expertise that you can use um, together. And the collective effort is sometimes much stronger than just an individual effort. So this is what I like to share today. And thank you very much. And you can contact me uh, via this email as well. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peyron. It's very fascinating and very inspiring, actually. So as a Causa Students Cultural Forum, it is an activist group. Uh, these points will be very useful for the students and for the participants here. There are a lot of takeaways uh, from your presentations. Very, very good. And one of the takeaways uh, would be, uh, like you said, you in order to do science, you don't need to be a scientist. That is a very good message because most of the participants today are, are actually not scientists, but they do a lot of science in real life situations. So this will be a great uh, message uh, for these uh, participants. Uh, this is very, very inspiring. That's very good. And also in your, most of your photographs, you showed uh, a lot of children, uh, they are doing a lot of activities, which is very important. Unfortunately, in, in Indian context, if I talk about in Indian context, a uh, lot of children are actually don't have access to these resources uh, because the curriculum not provided uh, such service to them. Uh, some of my uh, Bangal colleagues are here, so they may know this. Uh, we used to discuss this. So for them also, the, the one real experiences you have showed today would be very useful. So something they can do some action. Thank you, Peyron. It's very good. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, Thank you. Good. So now we have uh, our two eminent speakers have spoken very well about what they do in terms of uh, marine conservation. One from India and the other person from Singapore. Actually, uh, she's live from Singapore now. That's very good. So we can see that. <laughs> and so, so now the participants, uh, this is your turn. You can ask some questions. We have another 15, 20 minutes. So either you can ask, when you ask, please, uh, you can put the button like raise your hand. You can see in the chat box, there is an option called raise hand. Then if you click that, then the opportunity will be given to you to speak out. Or um, you can also do your questions on your chat box. So if you are not, if you are shy about speaking to the person here, so then you can, uh, I mean, uh, enter your questions through your chat box so either you can do raise your hand or put your questions in your chat box please now the participants try. hope everyone is here okay questions please johnson hi malati yes um lovely to see you here and it was wonderful to listen to uh, both the speakers um my name is malati and i stay and i live in bangalore um I know Johnson because I'm also doing, he was my tutor for my master's course in Northampton and pursuing my PhD with the University of Northampton as well. Um, I've heard a lot. The, the first interest for me was through Johnson. Johnson, thank you. Because every time I, we would meet Johnson, there was always that sharing that he would do about oceanography and ocean studies. So that kind of got my curiosity kicking. And uh, listening to these two speakers was just amazing. I just have one one question here. Um, with the current uh, situation of COVID-19 and a lot of, uh, you know, kind of people not venturing out into the beaches, uh, lesser amount of uh, uh, garbage thrown onto the seas, does it truly help the, um, uh, the fishes and the ocean lives? Does it make a difference to them? and to the fishermen as well? Um, so COVID, the, the whole pandemic, there's two things. The, the pandemic did adversely affect fishermen um, because firstly, they weren't allowed to go out. Those that were out were forced to stay on their boats and weren't allowed to come on shore. Of course, the markets were all closed, so they did suffer adversely because of COVID. Um, in terms of pollution, 
it's nice to see everyone posting about on social media you know the the air quality has improved there appears to be less garbage and things in the ocean but the fact of the matter is that all that garbage is still in the ocean the reason that the rivers are are cleaner is because all rivers flow into the ocean so you know all of that garbage and everything is still there and i think what would really be defining is how we now move forward with this is how we sustain not dumping more garbage into the ocean and i have to say at a very um at a very shallow level uh because we i haven't looked at it in in enough detail um it doesn't look very promising we are generating a lot of garbage um you know with masks with um i don't know if you've seen the airlines they've got the whole get up that's all plastic there's a lot there's it seems like there's more use of plastic now than there was um i mean or at least sustained level of plastic as there was earlier so you know there are there are short term gains um but i think in the long term we haven't really worked or addressed that problem sufficiently we don't see the tip of the iceberg and actually appreciating it for what it is absolutely yes yeah, yeah the, the other thing would be uh, fishermen actually is not uh, beneficial to the fishermen as well we asked the fishermen here whether it made any changes because of the natural ecosystems are not um, i mean fished very well so therefore have you seen any changes because of that so like uh, the land based animals come to the road and etc like that will there be more fish yeah. in the water but the fishermen no. said no it's not no. it's not like that it's a different ecosystem yeah. it's also yeah it's it's the feedbacks are much slower in the ocean so creating any change we'll only see a positive impact much later cuz those feedbacks are much slower than terrestrial ecosystems yeah good uh, thanks uh, nisha for the responding to that wonderful question from malady so now there is uh, another person uh, i think fabin uh, you have a question right so after that ratan sarkar uh, from bang i mean from calcutta he is asking another question so now over to um, fabin please hi everyone uh, thank you thank you johnson sir so uh, my name is fabin freddy i'm an i'm an active member of coastal students cultural forum can you hear me yes yeah yeah so uh, i like both of your lectures both of your sessions i really impressed and it gives me a very good knowledge and it informative as well as interesting because i love the ocean so uh tunisia uh, can i ask you one thing you told about new we have some some things uh, happening uh, like new beach appearing we have new beach appearing and we 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 lose some beach and things happen like erosion and things like that and um, can we just blame the unsustainable uh, development like a uh, sea wall making sea wall or something like that can we just blame on that or there are more chance of uh, chances of natural you know things like tectonic plates movement and you know lots of so many geographical things like that that also caused the uh, erosion that means erosion and loss of beach and appearing of new beach so how uh, how you, how do you think like that how how, how are you going to respond on that yeah uh that's a great question um the first thing i think that you need to differentiate between is acute changes and chronic changes so acute changes happen almost immediately you see the changes happening and that's what we're seeing with the sea walls and the development we're seeing in almost in a very short term period up to 10 years we're seeing changes in you know the appearance and disappearance of beaches we're seeing higher erosion and things like that with chronic changes like um natural morphological changes and tectonic changes and things like that those take much longer those will most likely the changes might not even manifest in our life lifetimes so um certainly you're right there are natural changes that are occurring um especially along the east coast um in particular in orissa and things like that where you know penta and all those beaches have some of the highest erosion rates in the world and that's not just because we're destroying natural um ecosystems it's also because of other causes so certainly but um in the case of ishaka 
uh, this change has happened so soon that it can the causal link can is has been made with the sea walls and other development activities. So we cannot just blame if any development activities that take place on you know we cannot just right. No, no. And that's one of the most, the hardest things about working in marine and coastal conservation. It is because feedback systems in the marine and coastal conservation space are so slow that we cannot definitively say sometimes whether it's one or the other that's causing certain things. Um, but I mean, by and large, uh, a lot of unsustainable development has caused very rapid changes along the Indian coastline. So it's better to take a precautionary approach in that case and say, if you are going to do development, do think about these changes and you know manage them, manage the risks. Thank you so much for responding on that. And uh, I want to I wanna say a thank you to Pei Ron Chiu. I don't know, did I pronounce your name correctly or not? The guy from Singapore? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, very yeah. thank you. I, yeah, I love your presentation. It's very informative, and I'm I'm really proud that I, I I came to know about some few activities. They're very creative. You are educating people in different ages, especially to kids. It's very it's very diff difficult to educate kids about about the you know about the seriousness of nature. But you're doing a lot of interesting workshops to uh, to to make them educate and to make them love with ocean. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Good, Fabin. Uh, we have another question from De Dr. Ratan Sarkar from Calcutta. Ratan, do you want to ask that question directly? You can unmute and ask. Okay, yeah, you are unmute now, so we can ask. Yeah, we so can actually, hear you. Uh, yeah, I am facing some technical glitches. Technical issues. Maybe I got disconnected. And anyway, yeah, yeah. So you can read out my questions. I'll just follow. Thank yes. You. Yeah, you want to ask now, or I can read out. Yeah, I can read out, sir, because I, I, I'm facing some problem. I do not know whether my voice okay. is clear. Thank you, Dr. Ethan. So I can read out Hello? your question. His, uh, his comment is like this. The idea of engaging children in such activities is excellent. Maybe there's the question or comment to Pei Rong. Pei Rong, uh, it is question to you, actually. Would you please suggest how, as a teacher, we can engage school children in such activities? Pei Rong, hey, the you. question to you. Yeah, good. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think um, teachers can engage students and children in uh, two main ways, either within the curricula or outside of the curricula. So within the curricula is how you can infuse and integrate um, nature education into your main curricula. So how you can incorporate it in some of your lessons. And sometimes it can be examinable as well. So I think this is what uh, we try to do at, in Singapore as well, to integrate um, nature education, about conservation, about biodiversity, about greenery, into the main curricula of um, different levels of education. So that's one way. The other way is using uh, other activities beyond the curricula. So you can think about it from a different um, setting. One would be in the classroom, how you can make use of interactive games, activities, lectures, videos, storytelling, or um, storybooks to share share with the students how, how they can make a difference. And you could also move to the field. So what we do with some of the students is we go into the field, we bring them out, and we expose them to the field activities. And they see for themselves um, what are these marine animals that we've all been talking about or we see on docu uh, in documentaries. Because sometimes we watch a lot of documentaries, but we don't really get in touch with these animals in real life. So that's what happens a lot in Singapore. And then you can also move online. So depending on the level of students and the resources that you have, the, the digital technology that you have available, you can move things online. Something like that, what we're doing today, uh, we can do um, a blended learning as well. Um, so these are the different ways. But I guess um, most important is really making good use of online resources that are available because there are lots of online resources for um, educators uh, in nature education and learning. So you can go and search online for lots of wonderful resources that are available can find activity sheets and you can also um, yeah, play documentaries. I think people really appreciate documentaries. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I fell in love with nature, apart from just uh, going out to mud flats when I was young, was because I watched Sir David Attenborough's documentaries on, um, I think it was the Blue Planet then, some time ago. And, and recently they have the Blue Planet too, uh, and Our Planet and many different, different documentaries that can appeal to people. And I think the important thing, uh, three main things, 
is ready to make it relevant. So what is your message that you want to send? Because you have to be very specific when you send it to your students and different levels of students, are, uh, you have to send them different targeted messages. So what is the message? Uh, why is it important to them? Make it relevant to them? Why, how, how would it affect them? How would it affect their family? How would it affect their friends? How would it affect their future? And then moving on to uh, what can they do about it? So the call to action has to be quite clear because a lot of times we stop at um, let's, let's know a lot more about marine life and conservation but we don't really share with them the message of what is it that you can do specifically as an individual, as a community, as a group, with your friends, with your family to make a difference. So the call to action has to be very clear as well. So using different interactive ways, making things relevant, infusing in the curricula, infusing it in your non-curricular activities are some of the ways you can do for, um, for with the student. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your uh, answer and explanation. Actually, I'm a member of a biodiversity management committee at my college, but the kind of activities that we are doing, basically assigned by the board. So uh, like, you know, mm, you know, plantation and all these things, the basic things we are doing basically. I, I do not also have much you know, knowledge about the matter that you're talking right now. So uh, it will be really great for us if you share some of the uh, documentaries or some of the work that you have done, if it is possible. So we'll go through that and we'll get idea from that. I think, I think that will be the takeaway you know, uh, from this you know, platform. And I'll definitely try to make use of the same if it is possible at all from my end. Thank you very much. Sure, I'll be happy to connect with you uh, maybe after this. Uh either LinkedIn or something, and then I might be able to share some resources that might be useful for you as well. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Very You're welcome. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank sure. you, Pei Rong. Uh, and uh, Ratan, uh, there is also one very wonderful resource uh, called Ocean Literacy Toolkit uh, by UNESCO. So you can Google that. Uh, in case if you are not able to get it, I can send you. Uh, sure, 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 sure. Uh, sure. So this actually from class one to class twelve, you can organize your lessons according to the age level of children. This is a very widely used uh, toolkit. More than forty countries are actually now using it. So I can send you that also. Sure, good. sir. Sure, I'll get connected to me. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. So good uh, speakers. Are you okay to uh, wind up now, or you have you have some more time for? some a few questions from the participants what do you think uh, i'm happy to answer any more questions if anyone has any okay, I, good. Nisha? yes same yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. same likewise yeah yeah, yeah so it's eight o'clock now so we can stop the one if the participants have any questions then let me ask them so i don't, I don't see anybody is actually asking any questions so nobody has raised their hand. Okay, uh, Shaji. Okay, oh, okay. Shaji Silla. Okay. Uh, I'm particularly interested in. Uh, I mean, both uh, speakers were also different topics. Actually, one is community surveillance. Another is, you know, connecting people to the nature. It's beautiful. So, but it's not really connected to your topic. But I'm really interested in uh, Singapore fishing. Um, I, um, I, I know about one of one of the communities there in Singapore called the last fishing communities in Singapore. Um, you know the uh, the construction of dam displaced uh, some of the tribes to a margin of Singapore. No, so Singapore we see is like a, you know one of the most beautiful country. You know, well developed one. But we have a uh, fishing community over there, right? So, do you have any connection with the fishing community in Singapore? I mean, traditional fishing community. My, any any thought about how you connect with their children, their experience in your uh, activities? You know, you, you can speak about them also. I mean. Singapore is a small country, definitely you, you might know them too, right? 
So thank you for your question. Um, I think the context of fishing and fishing communities is very different uh, in Singapore uh, compared to India. So we don't exactly have traditional fishing communities uh, from, from my knowledge. So we do have a, uh, most of us, we import our, our food, our fish uh, from other countries, but we do have a few um, people who do uh, recreation fishing, recreational fishing. We have fish farms as well that located in certain parts of Singapore in the north as well as some, some in the south. So they breed fish in terms of like aquaculture to uh, as a kind of food food source. Um, and um, I don't the the fishing community in Singapore is not as significant as uh, what you see in many other countries. So in fact um, it's a very tiny proportion of um, our economic activity in Singapore. So most people are mm, fishing, some of them fish for, to sell, just more of subsistence in a different way. Like some of them do it more for leisure. So we don't really, we're not driven by this like fishing industry in Singapore. So um, your question about whether they would, uh, the traditional fishermen and their children, how we connect with them. Uh, we, we actually engage the fishing community, especially the recreational fishermen as well as the fish farms in a different way, just trying to share with them how, um, I think there are different groups trying to engage them on how we can fish more sustainably. So um, there are different groups available, but it's a very, very totally different context. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, for Shaji, for asking that question. And good, very good response from Rong also. So any other questions to Nisha or uh, Rong from the participants? Okay, so Kumar, uh, what do you suggest? Are you there? Uh, there's a question. Okay. There is a question uh, from Shabnam. Shabnam. Ah, Shabnam Raman. Hi, Shabnam. How are you? Please ask your question. Yeah. Thank you for your question, but I can't really hear what you said. I heard um, intertidal, I heard children, I heard autism, but I can't um, quite make out your question. Would you mind typing it out on the chat, please? I think that would be very useful. Yeah. Sorry about Good. that. I can't, can't really hear what you, what you said. Yeah. Shabnam, your question uh, is not very clear to the uh, speakers. Can you type your questions, please, on the chat box? I think it was um, related to children with special needs, how to engage them with Marine and coastal. Um, yeah, whether the ocean environment like can be a, yeah. yeah, whether ocean yeah. environment can be a therapeutic experience for the children with autism. That is what I. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, I don't have very. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with children with autism, but I, on a personal note, I have volunteered with um, uh, youth with and youth with Down syndrome. So uh, they have, they're actually very artistic and creative and very appreciative of life and the things around them. So it's always quite an interesting experience volunteering with them. And in fact, I actually learn a lot from them when I volunteer with them. So I think the experience of connecting people with nature, um, there's this whole concept on um, nature therapy and even art therapy as well, where you, we could bring people out in nature and then they connect them with the, the senses, their senses, the sound, the smell, the sight, the colors, and all the different um, exposure to the different sensations in, in the environment can be quite um, therapeutic for, for them as well. I'm not, I'm not exactly very sure how it works, but I do know that there are people working on um, the concept of nature therapy. Uh, and there's also something called Parks Prescription uh, that people doctors actually prescribe um, their patients to go to the nature areas uh, to have to, to as a form of medicine but it's, it's just an exper an experiential medicine kind of treatment for them as well so i think it's definitely an area worth exploring um, recently i heard someone talk about ecotherapy as well that they use gardening to connect people with uh, to connect people with nature and not just that to help people recover from some of these um, mental uh, mental health issues such as depression stress um, anxiety and things as well so definitely an interesting area to explore and and I think people people some people might have already worked on it as well so yeah yeah that's very good Prerong. you uh, responded to this question very well uh, you have a lot of ideas as well 
So I uh, see. I can add one more thing. There are a lot of uh, study and academic uh, literature available. How this uh, ocean environment can be helpful for children with special needs, especially autism. I have seen some of the studies. Maybe, yeah, like uh, the nature ecotherapy and some other kind of uh, studies are available. People use that. Good. Thanks uh, for the question from Shabnam. Is there any other questions? So yeah. I think let us uh, conclude, right? Yeah, we can con conclude with some reflections. Yes. Okay. So uh, thanks uh, so much again for the um, the speakers. Uh, they spoke actually very well, and they have a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, these ideas can be taken by our Cosmos Culture Forum members, and also a lot of the speakers. Who are here? Uh, they came to this platform for their personal interests and something they like to do with the nature. So this is very good. And uh, this is uh, when people think about nature, uh, they often miss uh, ocean, also part of the nature. Uh, that is something uh, people are working uh, in terms of ocean conservation. That you can hear from what Nisha actually spoke about her own experience in Vishakhapatnam, working with the fishing community, the biocultural diversity there, and also the nature education uh, happening in Singapore. So these kind of examples uh, will be very helpful uh, to the people who are looking for some kind of activities, some kind of action they can do. And uh, remember, a lot of things are coming in terms of ocean because 2021 to 2030 is an ocean decade. So a lot of uh, ocean related uh, steps are coming up. So uh, it's very nice to uh, hear from these uh, speakers as well. Uh, it is their passion as uh, ocean lovers. Uh, they do a lot of activities in terms of conservation. And uh, thanks, uh, question, good questions from the Participants as well. Uh, we have a question about how the this will be uh, the impact of uh, COVID, for example. And Ethan asks uh, how this will be very helpful for children, and how uh, this can be helpful for the children. Special education is how educators should think about it, and what happening the construction and natural environment in terms of beach erosion and beach accretion. So then we also have a question about the Singapore traditional fishing communities. So uh, that is very fantastic. So this is a, a kind of a very interactive sessions. Then the, our, uh, the speakers actually responded very well to these questions as well. Hope you all enjoyed uh, this and um, we would like to keep in touch for further information. If you like to know more about ocean and today's session in general or any other issues related to. And it would be also interesting if you like to know further any particular issue or anything related to ocean, please let us know. So we can include in our next uh, webinar. Uh, Cossessons Cultural Forum is an organization actually uh, working from South India, mainly based in uh, Trivandrum, Kerala. So we work for work with the students and the youth, and also with the fishermen to raise awareness about uh, ocean and ocean's contributions, how to love the mother nature, and etc. So we are going to do these activities throughout the year. So because this is a, actually preparatory year for the ocean decade coming in 2021. So we will continue this process. Uh, thank you very much for uh, participants and thank you very much for the speakers. You did very well. So Kumar, uh, now you can uh, summarize and maybe we can conclude the sessions, okay? So well, thank you very much, uh, Hirong and Nisha. It was really insightful and interesting and thank you for being here in the evening and it was really a nice discussion i hope <laughs> and thanks again for both of you and thanks all the participants and dear friends of ocean thank you very much and uh, we can meet the coming monday with uh, new topics and new talks with the ocean let's talk ocean thank you thank you very much
Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.